going to get started with uh, our afternoon sessions. We're almost there. Yes. All right. Hello, everybody. Hello. How was lunch? Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. So uh, my name is Kathleen Stone. I'm the Director of Curriculum and Instructional Design here at Empire State College. And I've been um, working with Megan and a lot of other wonderful people on, on planning out this day. I wanted to first give a, you know, a, a little bit of background of your next set of presenters and how they ended up here. Um, so when we first started planning this, we knew that we wanted to reach out to somebody from Temple specifically Temple, because we had already heard that they were really doing fabulous things with uh, accessible technology initiatives on their campus. They're kind of well known in the accessibility world as doing some great things. And so uh, I, we reached out to, to one particular person that we had give, been given the name for, um, and I had not heard a response yet. And then I ended up attending a, a, a special event. It was the... Um, I have to always look up what it was called because it was a weird name. It was the Accessible Instructional Materials and Technology Summit that was sponsored by the Association of Higher Education and Disability. Um, and so I ended up at a table with a colleague of mine and three unknown attendees to me. And, um, and it turns out they were from Temple University. So to add to this kind of coincidence, I learned that the person that I had emailed was no longer at Temple in the position that I was targeting, um, and the person who was, was sitting at the table with me. Uh, so that was wonderful. So not only did I get to have, and this is Brent, and I will, I'll talk more in a second about him, but not only did I get to, to have Brent come, but because I got to know the other two gentlemen that were sitting with him, we get the benefit of having three people from Temple. And the, their different perspectives and how they work together, I think, is really critical and important. We heard earlier this morning about how important it is to have everybody kind of involved. And so they're, they're a good example of how different perspectives help. Um, so I'm gonna introduce you to, to them briefly. They all have extensive bios, and if I go through their entire bio, you'll just be hearing me talk for the next hour. So uh, quickly, uh, we have Andrew Lessman, who is the, he's at, at the far end. Andrew, raise your hand. <laughs> He is the Associate Director for State Authorization and Compliance within T Temple's University Office of Digital Education. An interesting fact is that Andrew holds a law degree from Temple University and is licensed to practice law in the state of New York. Uh, we also have Brent Whiting, who is here next to me. And there we go. <laughs> Brent is the Director of Information Systems for Academic Computing at Temple University, and he's the person I should have emailed right away. Um, he also serves as Project Manager for the University's Accessible Technology Initiative. And then in the middle, we have Daniel White, who is the Associate Vice Provost and Director of Digital, Digital Education at Temple University. And Daniel's extensive career includes serving as faculty at Roosevelt University, and he was uh, at Southern New Hampshire University. He was the Founding Associate Dean of Education, uh, where he spearheaded a national teacher certification program spanning six time, time zones and developed three graduate degrees in instructional design, higher education administration, and dys dyslexia studies. Um, that one was through a partnership with the Landmark School in Massachusetts. All right, so please welcome Temple University Dream Team here. <laughs> Thank you, Kathleen. Thanks, everybody, for having us. Um, I really think that the, the segue has worked out pretty well today, how we've gone from a, a very personable story to sort of the classroom environment and to a broader institutional sort of uh, systematic approach to this. Um, and I think it, it rounds out well. We weren't sure quite how we were going to fit into some of the context of this, but I think it works pretty well. Um, so speaking specifically about Temple University, um, what I, I think that the initiative aims is, you know, in support of the students, in support of Faculty for Universal Design, the initiative hopes to put the proper tool set in place so that people don't have to make those decisions. Am I doing something that's accessible or not? It just becomes part of the collective conscience. So that's the goal. Are we there? No. Will we get there? We hope so. Um, so a little bit of background about Temple University. Um, we are based out of Philadelphia, approximately 37,000 students and 5,700 employees. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but um, 17 schools and colleges. Um, and we do have a, a fairly large 
um, grouping of students registered with our Disability and Resource Services. Um, so as mentioned before, there might be 1,400 students registered with Disability and Resource Students, but that shouldn't be everybody we're focusing on. There's equal amount of people that attempt to go without those resources um, and complete their degrees um, and their program work. Um, our founder, um, we have a lot of pride in, in sort of the, the foundation of Temple University. It was started by Russell Conwell um, in the basement of the Baptist Temple, which is still on campus today, to serve people that would otherwise not have the ability to get a, a higher education. Um, it, it started out just as tutoring sessions and grew into this college and this full university. Um, and as a uh, biography that was written about him and is referenced on the website, one of the, the obligations to educated persons, he feels, was to serve the less fortunate. So a lot of times at Temple, we speak to this with initiatives related to financial assistance and for making sure that our tuition is down. But I also think that uh, speaks to the broader scope of you know, people with you know, disabilities or you know, that might be otherwise untraditional or more have a few more challenges ahead of them. So before the grumbles and groans about me referencing Wikipedia on this, <laughs> there's a specific reason why I have this. It's because the Wikipedia defines accessibility as the degree to which a product, device, service, or environment is available to as many people as possible. Does anybody notice a specific word that's left out from that definition? It doesn't use the word disability to define accessibility. So this is sort of, again, this, this thinking about rather than always looking at disability, like this is all inclusive. We want everybody to be involved. Um, Dr. Rapp mentioned the laws earlier, so I'm not going to go into the detail. Um, the one piece that was introduced at a revision of the uh, Rehabilitation Act in 1998 was Section 508, which specifically deals with uh, electronic and information technology, often referred to as EIT. Um, that being said, even though that some of the laws are applied to the e e electronic information, the complaints that are fired typically go against Section 504 in discrimination cases. So you'll see when you do research about background on an on a application or a technology, the research might come against Section 508. However, if you're looking for legal implications, they fall under 504. Okay. And also, just as a reminder, 1990, 2015, 25th anniversary of the ADA. There were events and things that happened this past July, so everybody be aware of that. If initiatives get started and you're trying selling points as to why we might want to start this, why we shouldn't, you know, it's you know, a good talking point as well. So talking about why now. Um, everybody knows that technology is taking off in education, the dependency, um, and it's important to note that we want to make sure that we're framing technology in an inclusive and broader scope as opposed to then further isolating. Um, unfortunately, you know, technology is a, a sort of industry that's really in its infancy. You know, we don't have building codes, you know. Your building codes, we referenced also earlier about ramps that are required to go into building codes. But what sometimes gets lost is, okay, a ramp is a legal necessity for wheelchairs, but as a parent, it's pretty helpful for a stroller, too. You know, so there's these benefits to broader population that sometimes gets overlooked when you're strictly looking at the legal obligations. You know, and we talk about things that are requirements of closed captioning for courses, you know, as it pertains to people with hearing disabilities, but the benefits to people with, you know, second language learners, you know, and all these things. There's, there's broader benefits to all of this. So, you know, we'd like to move the conversation away from the legal pieces of it. However, that's what moves the pendulum sometime about getting funding and making awareness and establishing initiatives and policies. Okay. So just as a uh, general FYI, there are over 30 active or current litigations and settlements against higher education. Um, so this isn't a small thing, and it's only going to grow. Um, and on top of that, um, the Department of Justice and Education are putting a profound focus on technology in the classroom. Okay. So why was Temple motivated? I'd love to say it was just our moral compass, and we wanted to do the right thing. Um, but it came out of um, our, one of our associate vice presidents in computer services um, read the settlement that happened with Penn State back in 2010 and began starting to nudge our CIO, vice president of computer services. This is something we should pay attention to. A little bit, nudge, nudge, nudge. Didn't really get through. There was a lot of things you know, going on at the university at the time. And finally, she printed the settlement out, walked into his office, put it on his desk, and walked out. So finally, he read this, and it really lit a fire under him. Because for the first time, well, at least the first obvious time, it was uh, 
a settlement that reached across sort of just online learning or websites and it encompassed the general accessibility of the university. So what you'll see is there's a bullet point list of some of the things that were part of the settlement. And then when we moved into our initiative, we very much followed these bullet points to set up a structure to follow what was you know, intended and what was you know, what the outcome of that settlement. So how did we get started in this process? So surveying other institutions, and this isn't necessarily direct outreach. We had some conference calls about procurement policies. We had about initiatives getting started. But what this also speaks to is joining listservs. There's an Athen listserv, which is a national institution for accessibility. There's an Educause IT access listserv. So it's not just reaching out, asking questions, but you can just monitor ongoing discussions. There's a lot of really, really passionate people about this. There's a lot of people that spend a lot of time in and you know, developing resources and things. So there's a wealth of knowledge that's already out there. Um, you wish that there was a little bit more that was sort of systematized in the universities, um, but it's a good place to start. Um, so out of that, we discovered one of the first things we needed to do is we needed to have an external person come in and tell us what we're missing. You know, our intellect, our knowledge of the subject matter was obviously lacking because we weren't acting on it. So we hired a third-party vendor to come in and the core pieces to look at was website, were websites, learning spaces, computer labs, and then just an overall umbrella policy. Um, we also knew that there was going to need to be an overall vision and accessibility statement to support that policy. And one of the critical pieces, and this is a little bit jump, you know, added in here, that the policy had to be succinct. If we had some long, drawn-out policy outlining every regulation that had to be followed, the approval process would be enormous for that. So we wanted it to be a very clear, short policy. Um, and then once that was enacted, how do you spread it across? How do you communicate to your faculty and staff and, and just get it in a collective conscience? So what we found out, we were probably you know, pretty good to where most universities were that weren't assessing accessibility, which was to say we needed to address everything. Um, so it wasn't, again, that we were you know, intentionally doing anything bad, but we weren't doing anything you know, to promote overall accessibility. Um, so we do have a substantial amount of equipment. I mean, as a campus of 37,000 students, you can imagine, it's a, a pretty broad undertaking. You know, 125 computer labs, 3,500 workstations. We have one central computer lab that by itself has 600 workstations in it. So this was a, a big consideration, um, especially when you start talking to people and, and people are running budgets through their head and you talk about, does every single workstation need to be accessible? Does every desk in all those workstations need to be accessible? So there's, there's back and forth about like, okay, what do we want to do and what's reasonable to accomplish? So we went through all these things. The audit told us where we needed to do, and we formed the policy from that and our statement. So the statement says, Temple University is committed to providing students, faculty, and staff with access to its facilities and technology and information they need to succeed in and out of the classroom, and that those resources were acceptable, accessible in accordance with law. So again, want it to be all warm and fuzzy, but there needs to be sort of a benchmark of what the, the legal decisions are and the responsibilities are. All right, so the nitty-gritty about it, the policy the process. So the policy itself was adopted in, in November 2012, um, and I'm pretty proud to say it was only a two-page policy. I don't know how SUNY or your institutions work, but the idea of a policy which involves legal counsel can be a very, very long process. So what was done for this policy is the policy established a committee and then gave that committee the enforcement, the development, and the approval rights to set guidelines. And then ultimately, those guidelines answer to the committee. So there are a lot more flexibility in changing, updating. If you realize there's a new technology, you can rewrite them a lot easier rather than formally going through policy and updating. Um, not to mention, for example, Section 508 is going through a re refresh right now. So if they're revisiting that, we would have to revisit our policy to affect that. Now we can adjust guidelines on the, on the fly. The other piece that this was really important is that the person that's responsible, this committee wasn't going to be the clearinghouse for everybody to send everything their way and then make it accessible. The person that supplies the information is the one that's responsible for making it accessible. So you know, ultimately, that goes to a faculty member. Sometimes faculty members have resources in their department that they can go to. But the idea was the onus wasn't on this committee. This was just a governing body. All right, so in tandem with this, Apologize, the vocabulary is a little bit off on this. There wasn't a syllabi policy developed, but our syllabi policy was revised. Um, and the piece that was critical to this is, you know, we still are at a stage 
of an accessibility that we work with accommodations. You know, everything isn't 100% accessible. This was the exception to that. Every syllabi going into a course should be in an accessible format. Because in a lot of cases, students haven't disclosed at that point. They might disclose during the semester. So this initial piece of information, it's critical that that is accessible to everybody in the course. Okay, so call out that, you know, clarification that, you know, we still exist in a situation where if a faculty member is teaching a course and there's nobody that has disclosed an accommodation in that course, they're not required to make everything 100% accessible with the exception of the syllabi. Okay, just so you know where we're at with that. So the structure of this. So the ATCC is a pretty broad, broad reach of higher level people at the university from CIOs, um, associate deans, computer services representatives from faculty, HR, um, and so forth. You guys can see the list. Um, but there was a distinct focus on academic units when we applied to this. This was, um, I know that we need to consider human resources and administrative systems, and we do, but the focus is on the student experience, first and foremost. Um, similar to what was referenced in the FACT II sort of outreach at SUNY, um, we have re represent, representation, as we call liaisons, out among schools and colleges, and they're sort of the communication arm to the ATCC. They get information, they report back to us what they're doing in their areas, if there's problems and issues and so forth. Um, so that's sort of our liaison model that we work with. And then project working groups. These give us the flexibility of having a specific task-based accessibility issue or challenge, and they can attack that one challenge, bring that back for review from the committee, and then go back and forth and, and work. So again, the liaison model, similar to fact, it's, it's a high up within the school or college that appoints the liaison, and they feel, you know, I'd love to think that the, the areas have their own dedicated person for this, but that's not the reality, so this becomes a task that someone needs to be aware of. Um, and we've sort of modified slightly those roles. Initially, there was uh, substantial training that the liaisons went through as far as what they should be testing for accessibility, how to test it. And the reality of it is, since these, this is on top of typical job functions, these people might be touching these tools two, three, four times a year. So, you know, our expectation for them to have an expertise is probably a little bit unrealistic. So the main, main reason for the liaison model is for communication and reporting back. Okay, so we sort of have a, at least arms out there. So, apologize if this is difficult to read. Anyway, it looks a little dark back there. But so the, the general sort of diagram layout of this um, as, it, as it's set up, we've got the ATCC and there's a small group of co-chairs. Um, and that's just to sort of regulate some of the information that comes in. So there's some that might not be appropriate to the whole audience. And they can filter like, yes, these are decisions we should make. This is stuff we should hold off on. They're sort of the driving, the driving force. Um, and then we have the project manager, myself, and we all speak out to the liaisons. Um, the working groups, although they're tasked from the ATCC, the majority of the working groups are not people on the ATCC committee. They're out amongst the university, the people that are doing the work. And some of the participants you can see here. Um, we have a wonderful disability and resource services department. And even though there might be explicitly only listed a few places here, their arms are all across this initiative. And they're constantly reminding us of the new things that are coming up. Um, and it's really valuable to have that support staff and that knowledge that they, that they share and, and push along. Um, you'll also notice that we have an instructional support center. Um, tying in with the communication piece, this center is part of our computer services, our central computer services. And what we have to clarify sometimes is these are instructional technologists. So these people aren't going to help you with designing your course to be accessible, but they'll help you with the tools and, and the, the mechanisms to make it accessible. You know, similarly, uh, unfortunately, we don't have sound, but you'll notice we're clicking through this PowerPoint presentation. There's actually clicks as you go from one slide to another. You know, so some of those tips, you know, from an accessibility standpoint, somebody that's visually impaired, it can really help to know as a presentation is moving along to have audible cues to when you're changing slides and things as well. So that's the type of uh, value that the Instructional Support Center will bring. Um, similarly, you know, the tools that are built into Microsoft Office accessibility checkers, you know, online survey tools, what are accessible, what aren't, and how to use those. Okay, so procurement. This is the one piece that becomes uh, ingrained in the university and it has to to really raise, raise awareness as people are buying things. Um, but you'll notice we use the word procurement rather than purchasing because we do sometimes get softwares and systems donated to the university, but that should not be exclusive and that should not supersede this process. That information, if it's going to be used to present and provide value to the students, should be vetted the same as a purchased software. 
Um, and you'll notice we have here, this is an exception. This is not an exemption. So every two years, this needs to get revisited. And a, a specific case of where this is becoming beneficial is um, somebody was speaking about their music school earlier today. I'm not sure who that was. But um, in, in our music program, there are two industry standard music notation software. There's Sibelius and Finale. Neither one of them are fully accessible. And our you know, school of music has gone well out of their way to buy whatever accessible technology they can to make it accessible. And just this past fall, the one program finale has started to make moves towards Section 508 compliance. And now we're starting to have the discussions, OK, do we align ourselves with an industry standard that is accessible versus providing both to students? So a big part of this is just the dialogue. It's starting to have the proper conversations. And then that can exert pressure on the competitors to follow along. So again, this just gets stuff, gets some traction, gets it moving in the right direction. Um, so we have the initial request, ATCC review, um, clarification. Not everything goes to the ATCC. Um, things that are required for coursework, required for job function, um, have to go. And anything that's going to be publicly distributed. Um, if there's stuff that's you know a library resource and they have a reasonable accommodation, or it's something that's only going to be used by a handful of people, it doesn't go to a committee of 18 people to approve. All right, so what are we delivering and what are we measuring? So some of the quick wins that we had. Um, since this was instigated by computer services, we went through our facilities and, and made adjustments where we could. So all the centrally owned pieces, um, we could get feedback from our own staff, figure out what was working, what wasn't, before we started spreading this information across the university. Um, updated the control panel. So you guys see sort of the, the Amex control panel you have here. So we added audio to that. So if somebody presses a help button, there's a visually or visually indication on the screen, as well as somebody audibly coming through, explaining like, OK, we're on our way. What can I help you with now? So it's, again, those extra senses for every, every device. Um, we launched this uh, new accessibility standards at a university-wide web development. So any of the school colleges, as well as strategic marketing and development, everybody was aware of it. So some of the communication pieces were a little bit easier. Um, and then one of the other things that we're, we've circled back to now is we actually hired a visually impaired student to do some of the testing with us. So it was really valuable for DRS. It was valuable for the student as you know, an additional service that they might be able to provide in their career um, moving forward. So how do we get the information out there? The CIO went on roadshows to anything from you know, faculty senate to council of deans to collegial assemblies, spread the word, students as well. Um, and then we developed a website. Currently, the iteration of the website is sort of a clearinghouse of information. It's just everything that's specific to the, pop, the technology initiative. And anybody's free to use information that exists there for your own purposes if necessary. Um, it's sort of going under a li little bit of a modification at the moment to more of a task-based accessibility page. Because right now, what we're finding is people go to this page and there's so much information. Sometimes it's difficult to find the specific piece of information you want to find. So maybe it's filtered to, if you're a student, this is what's relevant to you. If you're faculty, this is what's relevant to you. And then reporting. So every year we do a survey that goes to the liaisons and is, is digested by the ATCC committee, finding out you know, how they're communicating, how we're communicating to them, what steps they've, taken in, steps they've taken in their school and college to further the initiative. And commitments. So again, remember, we're a pretty big institution, but there are financial commitments in this. So we've got 600,000 from computer services to date in this. And this goes anything from remodeling to you know, getting software to paying for that audit to paying for software for auditing. So it, it is a large number. But also remember, there are a lot of chunks of pieces that went into it. And where we, were exist, where we existed at, um, we were starting from ground zero. Um, and then schools, colleges across, they're not 80,000 individually, but they've broadly put 80,000 into it. And a lot of that is for captioning costs. And if you've done research, Captioning, when you look at like class capture length captioning, you know, it, it can get a little bit taxing. You know, it's coming down. But, um, and, you know, the costs luckily have decreased and more options have come on to the, to the table. Um, one of the things in particular is, you know, we look at this podium, you know, and we developed an ADA podium similar to the lecture style podium that could be self adjusted at the panel at the right spot, right reach, and everything. And, you know, you're talking about, you know, five to $10,000 for a single podium in a room. Well, just in the last year, we've discovered an adjustable height table that can accommodate all the same accessibility pieces for you know, a fifth of the cost. 
So the stuff is coming down, you know, as people want more open classrooms, it moves away from Podium. So some of that stuff that's a little bit more expensive is being tamed down. Um, but then there also is an ongoing labor commitment and training commitment within the department, you know, and as the liaisons get out there and the collective conscience, you know, hopefully that will get reduced, but it's going to also always need to be a reminder. So, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Dan. Uh, the Office of Digital Education was coming in line right around the same time as this initiative. So they're an office that sort of has, has seen this from its infancy and has uh, been able to implement it. So he's got a great perspective on how it's applied to the department. Thank you, Brett. Thank you. Uh, and, and thank you, uh, for, uh, Kathleen, for inviting us here to speak and, and to share. Uh, before I get started too much down the road with the Office of Digital Education, I just want to also mentioned that I'm a SUNY guy. I attended uh, a SUNY Oneonta. I know there's any red dragons in the room. All right, thumbs up, all right, and folks who are online. Um, you know, and, uh, and, and that has to actually get, be mentioned and, and woven into to this conversation. I was a social studies education uh, major and uh, a certified teacher coming out of Oneonta State. And uh, the, uh, the professors I worked with, uh, Dr. Richard Denicor, uh, Dr. Dennis Banks, uh, and doctors in Biwi uh, uh these are these are individuals whose uh, whose work still colors my thinking around how to create curriculum in a responsible way, and uh, and with that, um, I'm thinking about some of the pillars of their thinking that they shared with me. Uh, they were always c coveting the thought of circumstance matters. Uh, we always have to think about the predicaments of our learners, uh, the conditions that they're living within and how we can make education accessible to them. And I've never lost sight of that. Um, another piece of that is about prior knowledge. You know, we have to make sure that we are curriculum-minded, systems-minded, that everybody you're involved with, be it faculty, uh, be it students, uh, peers, everyone's coming into a situation with a bit of knowledge that you're probably better off accessing on some level, getting a sense of their thought and where they are before you move forward. You know, and the last piece of that would be accessibility. Uh, I had moved through uh, Oneonta State University's undergraduate and graduate programs of teacher education at a time when the ADA was being signed. Uh, these gentlemen who I was working with uh, were, were, were quickly fluent uh, within uh, those conversations. And uh, I knew that I had left Oneonta uh, ready to hopefully change lives and waves uh, in ways that would allow me to you know, create a curriculum experience uh, that would uh, provide uh, a place where people could safely share their knowledge, have that knowledge be respected, uh, but also uh, be provided learning experiences that were open to all in equal ways. You know, so those kinds of thoughts have always stayed with me and actually still kind of you know, stay with us today. Um, my office, the Office of Digital Education, was created July of 2014. Uh, it came in at a time at the university when they began to become more centralized and they're thinking about creating quality online programs. Now, it's interesting to think about that because uh, Temple University has had a pretty, uh, pretty prominent digital footprint. They're actually one of Blackboard's largest cons uh, customers. I mean, it's amazing. Right? But at the same time, we only have seven fully online programs. Lots of course sections, lots of activity in the space, but only seven programs. So the university, with its arrows pointing up, becoming a little more prominent nationally, decided to create the office because we know that we wanted to go online in a responsible way. Okay, and that responsible way included a lot of thought about systems, you know, regulations like state authorization, and also accessibility. So with the mindset that I gained from SUNY Oneonta, uh, with the good work that uh, Brent's group has done, uh, we became quickly very inclusion-minded. We want to make sure that all of our work not only aligned with the Temple mission about access, but also provided a place where both faculty and students would have their prior knowledge valued, and that would inform some decisions we make around curriculum and systems. We want to make sure that we created an environment where people who were six or 12 time zones away, you know, were never penalized, we'll say, for missing that synchronous session. You know, how can we create curriculum that would actually include them in where they are, their circumstance? You know, we want to be able to create online programming that use open source textbooks that would also allow for maybe a reduced price when it comes to using alternative resources. We want to go ahead and provide people a place for adult learners especially, because we're actually focusing on graduate programs and graduate certificates, where adult learners who are already cognitively developed in a way where they just don't need to be spoken to, but invited into the curriculum, 
we want to create ways for them to actually have the, the, the word I being used in discussion boards and have the word I being used in metacognitive reflections so that we can actually value their experiences and weave them into the process. And it's interesting to think about that because a lot of folks are consumed with templates. A lot of people are thinking about how can I make my course as efficient as possible? How can I actually go ahead and analyze large swaths of data across cases and how can I let the word I in there in ways that would actually seamlessly weave onto that map, that we've woven into that map? So, those are the kinds of things that drive our instructional design team you know, and our regulatory, regulatory affairs team uh, to really create a, a, an office that's trying to launch something special at Temple that is responsible. It just, 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 doesn't, just, just doesn't cut across instructional design structures, but everything we do. Um, we're trying to take a proactive stance as well. You know, some people, I know at the conference, again, that uh, Kathleen had mentioned, we had heard from the different experts there that it's important for universities to come up with a comprehensive plan, similar to the one that uh, Brent has outlined, where you're proactive, where it appears that you are explicitly concerned with the lives of your learners and the constituents that you serve. You know, so what we're trying to do is do everything up front. We're trying to make our websites accessible, our courses accessible in ways I just described, but also do it in a way that lets folks who might knock on that door, and we know they will, because they will knock on everyone's door. We'll have an answer for them to let them know that we're, we're trying at least. You know, and the Office of Digital Education will help move that conversation forward so that as we actually begin to engage in conversations with the feds or different groups, that we know we can actually fall back on a plan that, of course, will have to be improved. But at least we have something, and we feel good about that. When it comes to the actual instructional design division, we do have a commitment to being universally designed. What's interesting though, at a research-minded university, we do have a lot of researchers who are great teachers, but for the most part, there's a lot of researchers who happen to teach, and then as far as those teaching online, it might be a full standard deviation away from how they understand teaching. You know, so what we need to do is kind of move incrementally. You know, there's sometimes you just wanna say, let's go for it. You know, I lived in Chicago for a long time where Scott Burnham, the uh, architect said, make no small plans, or Daniel Burnham said, make no small plans. I think, though, when it comes to instructional design, you have to take time to figure out where your faculty are. You have to take time to understand the pedagogical content knowledge about their discipline, about how they want to see it re-represented online in ways that do all of the things I talked about earlier that would provide for a nice template that would be consistent, that would uh, go ahead and inform the entire program being built in a certain kind of way, that allows students to really know systemically from course one to course 12 in a graduate program to feel like they're being cared for. You know, and that's something that we actually think about. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Rapp had mentioned earlier about this notion of how stress can impact. You know, our instructional design team is high on usability and high on accessibility. We want to be able to create experiences in our group that allows for people to know where everything is, to know what's going to happen when, to have actually program members, faculty members say, you know, our discussion board rubric from course to course to course, after some compromise, after some conversations, after the collective identity of that group comes together and creates a material product, like a rubric to say, yes, this is what we believe in. It's interesting when research professors are given a chance to come out of their silos in ways that they believe in, what can happen? And we're trying to really engender that in all the things that we do through structured conversations with them. Okay. Before we launch any course, we engage our library staff. We engage the accessibility team. We talk about technologies we plan to use. We run courses, we run uh, research articles through checkers. We run, uh, uh, we actually have people uh, uh, sit down with the, design, with the uh, director of, 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 of uh, excuse me, uh, <clears throat> the, 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 the Office of uh, uh, Disability Resource and Services. We have them sit down together and go through the course at this point. The reason why we can kind of do this right now is because the volume's a little low, we can handle it. We're building, we're gonna be launching 10 programs in the fall, but we're trying to build a culture around this. We're involving different offices around this. We're having disabilities people sit down with the li library liaison for that particular discipline and have them be able to actually get together and say, do we have these resources? Can we create a reference sheet for them that can be linked in through Blackboard? Then can we definitely guarantee that the, the, the screen reader you know, or the, uh, the, the transcript for a certain video we have is available. So we have these integrated conversations that just weren't happening before. That's, I guess, the power of the office is that we're allowed from a central location to really think about how to bring people who should be talking together on a large campus together. You know, and so far, so good. 
Um, there are pieces of our program as well. As we're trying to get the word out there about our office, let folks know that we're there. We have launched a newsletter. Now, it's interesting. I launched this newsletter at the very beginning of this past term. It had good-looking news stories. It used click-drag technology. You know, it had some nice graphic interfaces, you know, and uh, when you click down links, a little tumble owl hoo -hoo would actually go ahead and go off. It was nice. It was nice. I asked Brent to sit down with it, and I just said, okay, have I hit the accessibility meter in the right place? He says, abysmally no. Okay? So even from a non-instructional standpoint, we have tried to create something that spread the word to our faculty, that's where that newsletter was going to, to let them know that everything we're doing, everything, is going to be accessible. Now, do we tell them about the failings of the newsletter? No. But if any of our blind professors decided to read our piece by using a screen reader, they know in that first example, with the software we chose to use, that they would have been stuck on the word chart header, chart header, chart header, over and over and over again. So Brent worked with our team to say, let's find a website, let's find an alternative to make sure that we can be tighter on this front, Dan, because if you're going to be so accessibility-minded, you really have to walk the walk. So, Brent, I'm thankful for that, and I think we've turned the corner on that. And it's just another way for us to actually begin to change a culture on campus. You know? And honestly, about a thousand readers will see that. All right? We'll have conversations about it at an upcoming conference, you know? and we'll actually be able to go ahead and tell people why that choice was important and get feedback from people about that. You know, and I just think those little wins, you know, are, are, are stories that are worth telling across campus, and we're going to do so. Okay, uh, as Brent has mentioned, we are part of the ATC. We are working closely with Disabilities Resource and Services. Um, we are trying now to actually take all those methods we're talking about, working with the library, working with closed captioning groups, working with our student workers, asking faculty members to sit with their library liaisons to produce accessible uh, research articles. We're trying to get everyone to the table and document those efficiencies because there might be a chance for us to actually get funding for positions, either for Brent's group or for my group, to split a line to have somebody come and do this on a full-time basis. We're trying to document these efficiencies in case we ask for a grant somewhere to say, we're trying to do these things, how can you help? You know, so we believe that by really taking seriously what you plan to do, then measuring what you are doing and sharing it with the right people can yield material pieces that can really help us make a difference. So again, Brent's group is really good about measuring and finding out what level of successes we've had around certain uh, uh, initiatives we've taken, you know, and we've just kind of taken up that torch. So I think that's it for my slides. Today.